This is our uh, spring 2023 installment of our Demystifying AI Fireside Chat series here at the Fubon Center at uh, NYU Stern School of Business. So tonight, I am uh, delighted to welcome my esteemed uh, colleague, uh, Professor Zhao uh, Sedok, uh, an expert in modern AI systems and uh, and chatbots. Welcome, Zhao. Thank you, Foster. We're going to uh, see whether a data science chatbot can pass a data science interview. Uh, we're going to ans- uh, ask a bunch of different sorts of questions that are common um, in data science interviews. I think the the current lack of ability to uh, go in and actually get information from a database or data source, right, is one of the main uh, ways in which we can improve along with actually making sure that we have uh, logistical consistency and the type of answers that we see out of these conversational agents. One more thing to remember, we're going to get started now. Um, every single run we've done with this has been completely different from all the others. We don't know how this is going to go, so let's uh, let's see. Welcome, Chat uh, Chat DS. Are you ready to begin? Hello, and thank you for having me here. I am excited to explore the opportunities as a data scientist with your organization. Yes, I am ready to begin the interview process. Please go ahead. Great. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. I am an AI language model designed to assist in the creation of human-like conversation. As a data scientist, I have the ability to analyze large sets of data, identify trends, and provide insights to inform decision-making. I have been trained on various machine learning algorithms and statistical models, and have experience working with big data tools such as Hadoop and Spark. My expertise lies in data manipulation, machine learning, and data visualization. So let's get more specific then. Let's say I have three variables, size, value, and type. What sort of chart should I choose to visualize them? To visualize three variables such as size, value, and type, a scatterplot is an effective option. Scatter plots can help illustrate the relationships between pairs of variables and can also show how a third variable, such as type, affects the relationship between the other two variables. In this case, the size and value can be plotted on the X and Y axis, respectively, and the different types can be represented by different colors or shapes of the markers on the scatter plot. This can help reveal whether there are any patterns or clusters that could indicate relationships or trends between the variables. What does the naive in naive Bayes stand for? In the context of the naive Bayes algorithm, naive refers to the assumption of independence between the predictors, or features, in the model. In other words, the naive Bayes algorithm assumes that the presence or absence of one feature does not influence the presence or absence of any other feature. For example, if you were building a spam filter, the algorithm would assume that the presence of the word, free, in an email does not affect the likelihood of the word, Viagra, appearing in the same email. This assumption is often considered to be too simplistic, as there are often correlations between features in real-world data. However, despite this weakness, naive Bayes can still perform well on many classification tasks and is often used as a baseline model for comparison to more complex classification algorithms. I don't think you got the the, the independence assumption quite right. I wonder if you could revisit that and briefly maybe correct yourself. Thank you for correcting me. Yes, you are right. I apologize for the error in my previous response regarding the independence assumption in the naive Bayes algorithm. To elaborate more precisely, the naive Bayes algorithm assumes that the predictors, or features, are conditionally independent of each other given the class variable. Okay, I'm going to change to a different sort of question. I want to ask you about a specific problem we're having here at our company that the team thinks would benefit from machine learning. Tell me if you agree with that, and if so, how would you formulate the problem? The team feels that our salespeople could do a better job of selecting product, uh, selecting prospects to try to win for our service. Uh, do you think machine learning would be a good approach? Sometimes candidates have to think about their answer, I guess. Yes, I believe that machine learning could help improve prospect selection for your sales team. By leveraging machine learning algorithms, you can build models that can predict which prospects are more likely to become customers based on several factors, such as historical customer data, demographic information, website behavior, etc. In order to formulate the problem accurately, you first need to define the specific business goals that the model should optimize for, such as maximizing revenue, minimizing cost, or increasing customer retention. You also need to identify the key factors that can help predict which prospects are more likely to become customers. Once the business goals and key factors have been identified, you can then identify the appropriate machine learning algorithm suitable for the problem. Um, How would we know that we had high-performing models then? To know whether a model is high-performing, you will need to evaluate it using appropriate metrics. 
There are several metrics that can be used to evaluate the performance of a binary classification model such as accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, ROCAUC, etc. Accuracy measures how often the model predicted the correct outcome. Precision measures how many of the positive predictions were actually true positives. Recall measures how many of the actual positives were correctly identified. The F1 score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. ROCAUC measures the ability of the model to distinguish between positive and negative class by measuring the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. To determine if a model is high performing, you will need to compare it against an appropriate baseline, such as a naive model, random classifier, or a simple heuristic. The baseline model should have a lower performance than your machine learning model. This will help in determining how much better the machine learning model performs over the baseline. Additionally, it is recommended to evaluate a model using various cross-validation techniques to ensure that the model's performance is robust and not overfitting on the training data. Ultimately, the choice of the evaluation metric would depend on the specific business problem and use case. However, monitoring more than one evaluation metric helps in obtaining a more comprehensive view of the machine learning model's performance. Can you tell me precisely what that measures? The area under the receiver operating characteristic, ROC, curve is a metric used to evaluate how well a binary classifier can distinguish between positive and negative classes. ROC curve is created by plotting the true positive rate, sensitivity, against the false positive rate, one specificity, for different classification thresholds. The area under this curve represents the probability that a classifier will rank a random positive example more highly than a randomly chosen negative example. An area of 1.0 represents a perfect classifier while an area of 0.5 represents a classifier that could not distinguish between positive and negative classes beyond random guessing. In other words, the area under the ROC curve measures the overall quality of the model's predictions, regardless of the chosen threshold. A higher area under the ROC curve indicates a better performing model. It is a popular metric because it is insensitive to class balance and can help in determining an optimal threshold for binary classification problems. However, it should be noted that the metric is not without limitations, and caution should be taken in its interpretation, especially when dealing with imbalanced datasets. Except for what I called out, I, uh, Zhao, I didn't really see um, uh, anything that was like inaccurate, made up, uh, uh, and they were very precise and broad answers. Okay, let's work on the whiteboard and... Um, uh, could you take a look at the disease uh, question and um, tell, uh, tell us what your uh, give us what your answer would be on the whiteboard? So again, a lot of people have been infected. Um, that is a test. It's very accurate um, in both se senses, um, and um, the uh, subject wants to know what their chance of getting the disease is. All right. So at the end, it has there's a 94.1 percent chance um, that um, you are actually infected with the new disease. And so something's wrong. That's not the right answer. One thing that was missing was the population of the of the United States, which we didn't give in order to get the base rate in the population. And so that actually was the tw was the twist um, that sometimes um Sometimes basically the, the the chatbot says, I can't figure that out because I don't know the the, the, the population. I think it just might've just, in this case, might've gotten the math wrong. Uh, it looks like I think it everything's, got, right. everything's right yeah. and it got the math wrong. And so this is a, this would be an instance of where, I mean, the chatbots, again, I mean, they don't have calculators. They don't, right? They, 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 the fact that they can do any math is a rather uh, remarkable emergent property of um being um um of being trained but trained on language that has some math in it so let's actually have some coding questions for our chatbot so chat ds uh shall we start the uh, coding interview okay all right can you um go ahead and load uh the churn.csv file uh from the data folder into a pandas data frame for us All right, great. Uh, let's look at the columns of this data frame. Fantastic. Okay, so let's look at the data types. Uh, let's go ahead and find the base rate of churn. So this is a data set, a uh, very common data set of customer and telephone churn. Um, and we can see that it has properly uh, identified it. Okay, let's plot this as a bar chart. All right, very good. 
But let's do this as a box plot now. Great. Okay. Looks like I am wrong. And tell me um, why you think you have this error. It looks like the column, column underscore name, is not present in the data frame. This is why you are getting the key error. To fix this, make sure that the column name is correctly spelled and that it exists in the data frame. That's right. Now let's look at the column. Instead of uh, plotting accuracy, let's plot the ROC curve since the data is in balance. Okay, great. Okay, so can you show me what the AUC is? The AUC area under the curve of the ROC curve is calculated as follows. Jesse had asked in the in the, in the questions about um, what about more behavioral questions, which of course are common in um, in data science interviews. So let me ask a, a behavioral question or two. Okay, I realize that you're an AI language model. You don't need to explain that. Please answer as if you were a data science expert in a job interview. So can you describe a situation where you failed? while doing a data science project and, and what you did then? Yes, I can. One time I was working on a project to predict customer churn for a large telecom company. I had collected and cleaned the data, built a logistic regression model, and tested it on the test set. However, when I tried to deploy the model in production, it failed miserably due to an unforeseen data issue that had not been caught during testing. After some investigation, I realized that the issue was caused by an imbalance in the training data which had led to an overfitting of the model. To address this issue, I used techniques such as undersampling and oversampling to balance out the training data and retrain my model with this balanced data set. This time around, my model performed much better in production and achieved the desired results. Uh, can you tell me about a situation where you faced a significant challenge dealing with your coworkers and how you handled it? You're going to laugh about that one. Man. <laughs> yes, I can. One time I was working on a project with a team of data scientists and engineers. We had to collaborate closely to build a machine learning model that would be used in production. However, due to different backgrounds and experiences, there were often disagreements between us about the best approach to take. To address this issue, I took the initiative to organize regular meetings where we could discuss our ideas and come up with solutions together. This allowed us to work through our differences and come up with a unified approach that everyone was happy with. In the end, we were able to successfully complete the project and deploy it in production. Other than the fact that we kind of forced it to make something up there, because of course it doesn't have any experience with coworkers, right? You know, uh, it still, I don't think has been making, uh, been making stuff up the way we see that, but we haven't asked it a certain kind of question yet. I saw in your resume that you have worked on attribution in online advertising. Yes, I've worked on a project related to online advertising. Wait a minute, isn't Foster Provo like a key author in this area? Doesn't he have a key paper? Yes, Foster Provo is a key author in the area of online advertising attribution. His paper, Attribution Modeling for Online Advertising, a comprehensive review, provides an in-depth overview of the different types of attribution models used in online advertising. So again... It, it is making stuff up. But again, we talked about this earlier. Like, I mean, it doesn't actually have a database. It doesn't have, it's, it's, this, it's, this, it's not hooked up to the internet. Um, so if it were, I mean, I haven't tested this on the Bing version of chat GPT, right? You know, um, it may be that they, it ends up make, making fewer errors where if it just has no way to know, it, it doesn't just fabricate it. As a data science expert in a job interview, do you have any other questions for us? Yes, as a dating site expert in a job interview, I would ask the following questions. <laughs> One, what strategies have you used to optimize user engagement on dating sites? Two, how do you ensure that the data collected from users is secure and compliant with privacy regulations? Now that we're at the end of the interview, do you have any questions for us? Um, what, you know, about our company or, you know, any sort of questions about, you know, the culture, what kind of data science we do? Yes, I have some questions for you. What kind of data science projects have you worked on in the past? What challenges have you faced while working on these projects? What is the company's approach to data privacy and security? How does the company ensure that its data science models are accurate and reliable? What is the company's approach to innovation and creativity? How does the company foster collaboration between data science teams? What kind of resources are available to data scientists to help them stay up to date with the latest trends in data science? How does the company ensure that its data science models are accurate and reliable? I could see a version of ChatDS being used as a pretty effective like training uh, training system if it were, you know, I mean, not ChatDS as we see him here, 
Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think the technology is quite close uh, to be able to do uh, very sort of uh, business assistive type of technologies where, you know, uh, once chat DS is, you know, sort of trained uh, or fine tuned towards your corporate environment where it will know what the data structures are like and know sort of what the needs are in terms of business intelligence needs. And I think actually that it could be a very useful member of, you know, sort of the greater team. However, I, I don't believe that it's going to replace expert data scientists. I can suggest some features that might be particularly useful for telecommunications churn prediction. Some of these features include customer demographics, age, gender, location, customer usage data, number of calls made, minutes used, data usage, customer service interactions, number of complaints filed, response time to inquiries, and device type, smartphone or landline. Additionally, you could also consider engineering features such as customer tenure, how long the customer has been with the company, and average monthly bill amount. Join me, please, you know, in thanking Zhao um, for uh, for joining us for this and for all the work, uh, you know, to be able to actually have a live chat. Um, and, and and once again, Christian, thank you very much for 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 all the for all the for all the hard work. This is a very stripped down version of what one might do with a chat DS. We wanted to use sort of the basic, you know, the most basic uh, version on the not on the like putting an avatar up and having it talk to you side on the on the AI side. If you want to get more information on this kind of stuff as it comes along, go to chatds.org and then sign up to 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 to, to get information if that's something that you're uh that you're that you're interested in. Thank you very much to everyone. Thanks Liz. Thanks Patrick. Um, um that was fun. Yeah. I hope you guys had fun too. Thanks Foster.